China's influence in U.S. politics has coincided with the industrialization of China at the expense of a deindustrialization United States. Global corporations, to which U.S. politicians answer to, fled high wages and environmental regulations in the U.S. for low wages and lax environmental standards in China. Now the U.S. is paying the price and may not fully recover to sufficiently defend itself against China's growing military. The strategic ambitions of one nation can and have upset the United Nations and the balance between powers. Now, the Western world must understand the imminent threats from the hegemonic ambitions of China. Hierarchy exists in every segment of society, from politics to unions, associations, corporations, and the military. In today's show, Dr. Cora breaks them all down and provides readers and viewers with a sense of what the world could well face if we allow hierarchy to continue its historical development towards a global and illiberal hegemony. Be it in China, the United States, or the European Union, all are vying for global influence and the utilization of the United Nations structure to promote either the principles of human rights and democracy, or in the case of Beijing, the exact opposite. This clash between democracy and autocracy on a global level could turn to war. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in today. Our host and moderator, president of Optimum Publishing, Mr. Dean Baxendale. Good evening. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, historic launch of the concentration of power. My name is Dean Baxendale. And uh, we're here with a distinguished panel of guests and the author of the book uh, to provide insights uh, into uh, where global hegemony is taking us and where it may lead in terms of war, in terms of conflict, in terms of power structures throughout the world. The Concentration of Power is an important book and, and one a book of our times. For those who understand the geopolitical history and how it's tied to the institutionalization of power leading to regional and global hegemonic powers, if left un unchecked, the chance of an illiberal order dominating the world is very real and an outcome that all of us might face. So first of all, let me introduce Dr. Kaur. James Krasta and Alexander Gray. Dr. Kaur had his BA and MA in political science from Yale University, graduated in 2001, and a PhD in government from Harvard University in 2008. He is the principal of Core Analytics and the publisher of the Journal of Political Risk. His books include No Trespassing, Squatting, Rent Strikes, and Struggles Worldwide on South End Press in 1999, and he edited The Great Powers, Grand Strategies, The New Game, The South China Sea, U.S. Naval Institute in 2010. A bit more recently than 2010. Ah, oh, okay. It's more like 2018 uh, or something. <laughs> very good. Uh, the, the two discussants will then be speaking about the book, Professor Kraska uh, has a dual appointment at the at both the Naval War College and Harvard Law School. He is also writing books about military technology and international law. Alexander Gray is the former chief of staff to the National Security Council at the White House. He is currently writing a book on the United States strategy in the Pacific Islands. First of all, a little uh, a little story about how this book came to be. Uh, and uh, with Optimum. The concentration of power, uh, I met Anders in, in April of 2020. Uh, I was busy readying myself for the publishing of Hidden Hand, uh, exposing how the Chinese <laughs> government the world. Uh, I read a passage about the Chinese billionaire who was a partner uh, with Forbes, who took exception to some of the writings of Anders, uh, who was shining a light about the CCP's malign uh, in state activities in America. Anders was then banned from, from writing any longer with Forbes. 
I was also uh, deep into the development of willful blindness by investigative journalist uh, reporter Sam Cooper, which clearly outlines the future of criminal uh, inflow of criminal proceeds into Canada and the United States uh, via casinos, luxury cars, real estate, and other commercial enterprises. All of these had a connection, and that connection was the CCP's very own United Front Works Department. UFW, as is colloquially referred to in the academic circles, um, has 22,000 employees stationed around the world and have integrated themselves into local China diaspora communities. They are loyal to the CCP and are most certainly loyal members and devout members of the party. I reached out to Anders, telling him what I was planning, and, and one conversation led to another. And the next thing I knew, we were planning a series of books. Um, and to talk about uh, how to protect free market economies and freedom and democracy, period. B Wall Street, Bay Street, and in Canada, uh, Bay Street, uh, Fleet Street, sorry, in the UK, and Bay Street in, in Canada, all of these have uh, found the influence of the CCP. We have helped finance the growth of China, and we have uh, certainly put ourselves in a very difficult and challenging position moving forward. The concentration of power uh, was a collaboration, uh, uh, collaborative effort between Anders, myself, and the editors at Optimum. We hope you enjoy the book. And with that in mind, I would like to welcome Dr. Kaur to int introduce you to the book. And then both James Kraske and Alexander, Alexander Gray will speak. We will then be opening it up to the audience for Q&A. And you can do that either on Facebook or YouTube, depending on where you're watching tonight's broadcast. Uh, the book is available for sale on the Optimum site and is available globally th with, through Amazon.com. And now my good friend and colleague, Dr. Andrews Kaur. Thanks so much, Dean. Uh, it's a real pleasure to speak with you and to be on with my friends, James and Alex, um, who are, you know, I really thank you guys for supporting the book um, and, uh, you know, helping, helping with this show. Um, you know, the book is, uh, has been developed, uh, you know, for years um, as my, um, thesis at, at Harvard dissertation, the theories that are found there uh, are expansive. There's there's about 12 theories, um, but in a very short uh, number of pages, just a few pages toward the front of the book. Um, and basically what I'm arguing in the book is that there's a concentration of power over historical time. If you go back to you know hundreds, thousands of years, um, and you trace the way in which political systems have developed. Um, you can see that they developed um, from many small tribes and clans to kingdoms, uh, to states, empires. Um, and as the empires break down, uh, they're not really replaced fully by fully sovereign states, although we often think about it that way now. They're replaced by often superpowers like the United States, uh, the former Soviet Union. And even China today is now developing into a superpower status that can challenge uh, the U.S. Uh, globe militarily um, in the South China Sea over Taiwan and can challenge uh, the U.S., for example, at the United Nations General Assembly, which, uh, you know, the U China is, is probably more effective at getting votes passed in the U.N. General Assembly uh, than the U.S. is today whereas the U.S. really led the development of the U.N. Um, back in 1945 and, and when it was conceived in the Atlantic Charter with Britain um, in around 1942. So there's a trend in history. You see this from tribes, kingdoms, and on to now international organizations, the European Union, where states are aggregating into larger units. Um, and this is, in a way, a, a problem because... Uh, if the states that aggregate, if the international organizations that develop um, turn in an illiberal direction, in, an, in a dictatorial or autocratic direction, um, then we may never get our sovereignty back. We may, may, individuals might lose their freedom. Um, countries may, may are losing their sovereignty. Um, and that is... A concern, and it's not a concern that I think is taken seriously enough, um, you know, in the in uh, established academic circles. 
oftentimes established academic circles will um, in general support the internationalization of politics. Um, and uh, you know, it's a it's a concern when Beijing has so much influence over places like the UN or Brussels in the EU. So this is the the basic argument, um, and that that the 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 return of power from these larger international organizations uh, is very hard to achieve. Um, Brexit in England is an example, a recent example where. It was able to extract itself from the European Union, um, but that's a very rare occurrence in history. If you look throughout history, almost always when you get entities like the European Union, they're quite stable because they have quite a, they have resources, economic and military, to keep countries like Britain inside uh, inside the Union. So that's that's the book in a nutshell. There's quite a bit more. But um, I'm, I'm limiting myself to just a few minutes as a first presentation, and uh, I look forward to discussing it with uh, folks on the panel and in the audience. Thank you, uh, Anders. Uh, a great introduction, and uh, I think that probably opens us up for uh, James Karaska's uh, comments. Um, James? Thank you, Dean, and, and thank you, Anders, for the opportunity to join this very interesting, really compelling discussion. So if I could offer just a couple of things that really struck me that I thought were uh, helpful uh, theories to, to place large, the larger history of humanity and polities in on sort of a timeline. And it seems to me that you've gone uh, quite a nice way toward helping to fill in some of uh, Kenneth Waltz's three lenses. In particular, the nation state lens, why the state just gets bigger and bigger, becomes an empire, as well as in the global system, how hegemonic powers rise and maintain their powers. And even if they're displaced, they're displaced by an even more powerful uh, entity couple of the lines of inquiry that I thought were especially compelling was your discussion on concentration of power from, uh, from, an, from the standpoint of, of illiberalism and expanding geographies, how the power deepens and expands throughout larger and larger areas. Even if you find in global politics, for example, where you have Spain and Portugal with putative empires that encompass the globe, but they weren't really that deep uh, and they didn't, they couldn't really administer the areas that they claimed. It was more of just a line on a map. But as they gave way to the Dutch and the English and the United States, and then the United States confronted the challengers that, uh, that are mentioned in the book, then uh, those administrative structures became more and more powerful. I also had never considered your idea of the oscillation effect, the disintegration of weaker, um, uh, the oscillation effect for, uh, for power imbalances, and then the ratchet effect of the disintegration of weaker hierarchies through competition. Also, I found it interesting, the idea of hierarchical skimming where the dominant units skim or take power from the, the weaker ones. This actually also, I think, is related to some of the dependency theory or neo-Marxist uh, models, such as Modelsky or Gilpin, uh, or even capitalist models where power can shift. This is a major complaint uh, in the North-South dialogue that, that power shifts from the South to the North. Uh, and so I think the, I thought that was particularly interesting. Certainly, if you look at the United States at Waltz's second level or nation state level analysis, it's absolutely clear that the federal government has skimmed power and continues actually even today, of course, to skim power from the states. Likewise, we see China skimming power from its neighbors, from Africa as it attempts to challenge the position of the United States. So I thought it was, uh, it's an incredibly uh, rich uh, 
incredibly complex, um, yet very readable. And uh, I appreciate being part of the conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, you know, excellent points. Uh, you've really, you know, dissected, uh, you know, many elements of this book that I think are, are you know, at first glance are hard to digest uh, and really provided people with some insights as to uh, how Anders is, has really expressed uh, these complex theories and, and made them accessible to, to a larger audience. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Alexander Gray. Alexander? Uh, muted. Well, thanks there so much for having me, everyone. Uh, Anders, uh, it was such a privilege to, to get to read the book and to, uh, to comment on the book jacket. You know, obviously, I, I am not an academic. Um, not not my background. So my career in, uh, in government and public service. And one of the things that I look for in books like this is how would a policymaker benefit from the findings of, of a book? And despite the fact that obviously this is written uh, from lots of theory, there's lots of very useful uh, expounding on on previous scholarly work. What I found the most uh, revelatory and useful about what, what Dr. Cork put in the book was that almost all of his theories are directly applicable to what's going on in the world today. Um, and you can just really unpack each of the theories. And I thought that they, they nicely overlaid with challenges that, that come across the president's desk, the national security advisor, the secretary of state on a daily basis. Um, I'll just go through a couple things that, that struck me uh, particularly, you know, we're, we're obviously in an era of great power competition as the Biden administration has continued that approach from its predecessor. One of the things that, that you know, Anders expounds in his, his theories is the, the concentration of power uh, hierarchies that th th this is really the, the academic way, I think, of saying we're in this era of great power competition larger polities are now in the historical pattern that he's elucidated regaining their momentum as the central organizing structure of the international system and of course there was a 30-year and 25-year interregnum where the united states particularly chose not to operate as if that was the operating assumption of the international system and and as anders i think eloquently argues we're reverting to type historical type is, is re retaking its roots and we're now back uh, kind of where we started. And so as we look at China, as we look at Russia, um, I, I think that very much everything he argues about hierarchies is borne out on a daily basis. I, I thought that his point about skimming was particularly insightful for what we're seeing today. And, and really what that is, is a persistent pressure being placed on smaller polities. I, I have a background in the Pacific Islands, as was mentioned, done a lot of work uh, there, and they are under perpetual pressure for, from China. And it is that that pressure from a larger illiberal polity on smaller vulnerable ones uh, that we are seeing manifested constantly in that part of the world. And it's obviously not just the Pacific Islands, it's Africa, it's Latin America, it's, it's, uh, it's a great deal of, of, of what's going on globally. And so I think Anders puts that nicely in a, uh, in a theory that can be digested by policymakers and, and practitioners and academics alike. Um, finally, illiberalism. I think that the, the spread of these hierarchies and the concurrent um, illiberalism that we're seeing, particularly in China and in Russia, and how that is permeating the international system down to middle powers and then to developing powers, I think that that's... Um, very much going to be one of the defining uh, subcategories of the, the great power competition that we're seeing in the coming decades. And I think that that's nicely elucidated. And the three theories I just mentioned, I think they all fit together in a way that's digestible, it's understandable, and that reflects the world as it is, not just uh, not just theory. And the, finally, what I would say, I think, is we, we think about. Uh, hierarchies, we think about 
China competition with the United States and the, the West more broadly conceived. Um, economic competition is obviously something that's very much at the, at the core of these discussions. And I think that Anders' theories are particularly apt, not just for geopolitical competition, diplomatic and military competition, I think they're also very apt for economic competition and the use of economic warfare as the Chinese have, have used it over the last 20 years. Um, that economic warfare is one manner in which they are compressing politics, where the skimming is happening by taking, by breaking industrial deindustrialization, breaking the manufacturing base of competitors, uh, forcing countries into tributary relationships with China. That's just another form of what Anders has argued in his theories. And so I think, uh, just to, to end and, and help move it over to the audience and, and for discussion, I think that the, the great trends that we're seeing in geopolitics that are often at the policy level thought of in, in very, um, they're, thought, they're thought of in kind of the ways I, I laid them out, U.S. versus China, China uh, versus Russia, China and Russia competition at some level. Anders takes those, puts them at the macro level, puts them in very sophisticated and, and erudite language, and offers a template that I think we can all uh, work off of as we try and better understand the challenges that we're going to be facing. Thank you. Muted. Thanks, Alex. Very much appreciated. Still muted. You guys are, you guys, uh, both of your comments are really, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Alex, thank you very much. I just wanted to actually uh, build on, uh, on your presentation there. Uh, obviously, we saw a move within the previous administration uh, direct posture shift in how the State Department, uh, how the military, and how intelligence community uh, was treating China. Uh, no longer did it appear as a simple strategic competitor, but really as a strategic, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, uh, not competitor, but what really some uh, an organization I call them an organization as opposed to uh, a nation state because I think they operate in the in a malign state uh, apparatus. How we saw that that shift, that shift seems to still be uh, in place and being taken very seriously in Washington with this administration. Can you kind of comment on that? How you see the Biden administration picking up from where? Pompeo and people like Miles, you within the State Department uh, who helped develop the China policy are really carrying that forward uh, today. I think there is a bipartisan consensus uh, to some extent on the China issue. And I think that's uh, you know one thing that I think we really have to do better of is working together um, from across party lines, whether that's in the US or other countries. I think in other countries too, you see um, a, a bipartisan, you know, multi-party um, agreements. And even with IPAC, which Dean, you're part of, uh, IPAC, the uh, interparliamentary um, China group, uh, you know, you see international coalitions of legislators who were starting to be alarmed about China and uh, cooperate internationally to promote legislation. So I personally, I think that's very important. And I think that uh, uh, this bipartisan approach uh, multi-party approach to uh, the China issue is absolutely critical. Otherwise, China divides and conquers us. Agreed. Uh, Alex, did you want to pick up on, on some of the thoughts there on, uh, on that and, and, and where you see the Biden administration right now? Yeah, absolutely. And look, the Biden administration continued a lot of what President Trump started. And President Trump's legacy, uh, his greatest legacy, is going to be repositioning the, the approach of the entire U.S. government uh, to focusing on China. When the, the administration started, China was not the number one priority of the U.S. government. It just wasn't. And when he left office, um, whatever he may have done in other spheres, you had the Department of Labor, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Department of Agriculture, and on and on and on, focused on the competition of the threat posed by China. And we've seen over the last 10 months, the Biden administration 
um, has done that. And their, their interim national security strategic guidance makes that point, changes the language a little bit, it adds a little more uh, flavor, you know, progressive flavor. But the general crux of great power competition being the organizing principle of U.S. foreign policy is the same. And, and we can argue about some of the things that focus on some things more than others, the emphasis, the language, the verbiage is a little different. But I, I've seen nothing in 10 months to change my view that they have uh, adopted that position and, and seem to be hewing pretty closely to how President Trump and his administration conceived of the challenge. If I could add, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you. Excellent com uh, commentary, uh, Alex. And, and uh, James, did, did, did you have anything to add there? I do. I Thank you. So all I would say is that it remains to be seen whether this administration or the next administration or the, the U.S. government in 15 years, uh, if the rhetoric is not ahead of the skis. And I'm concerned enough to think that it might be. It's, it's fine and good, just like the British uh, or the French after World War II to talk about maintaining your position in the world. But as the Chinese say, talk does not make rice. And so the, the proof will be in whether the, the US government, regardless of who is leading the executive branch, but also the other two uh, uh, equal branches of government, whether the U.S. government can maintain a unified, vibrant, and economically dynamic country. And although these are strange times, the 10 months or so that, that have transpired in this administration suggests that, that this issue is at least an open question because power is based principally is founded in economic power, in my view. Uh, and military power and political power flows a lot from that. And it's not clear to me whether the United States, and in particular this administration, will make the decisions to ensure that the United States it remains a dynamic, cutting edge uh, technology and economic power. The one point I would make, uh, and I agree with that 100%, and I think you're seeing that manifest itself in a couple of ways. One is the fact that we haven't necessarily made the technology investments um, over the last 10 years that we should, and how we approach things like the CHIPS Act and, and other things that are, are beginning to make some of those investments, um, that's going to be a telltale sign. The other is long-term military investment. Um, we're just not maintaining the level of continuity in defense investments that we have to. Um, and the, the Chinese look at our, to take shipbuilding for one example, the Chinese look at the trend lines for shipbuilding, and they're headed towards 400 ships, and we're, we're in make-believe fantasy land, or the, the out years, as people in Washington call it, we're headed to 355 with no conceivable plan to actually get there. Um, that's the sort of thing that if we continue on that sort of that type of trend, not only will we not be able to compete with China in actuality, but our partners and allies will look at it as a signal of our staying power and they'll begin the, the bandwagon effect that people always talk about will come true because they, they will the proof will be in the pudding and they'll they'll uh, act accordingly. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, I could, you know, I think we could probably uh, just on that one one question and and point uh, probably spend an entire hour on. Uh, we do have a, a question from the audience, and I'd like to uh, present it to you. Um, and it says, China may want uh, to be the hegemony of the world, but the Russians and Indians or uh, may disagree. With that, more than the USA. Um, is China just blocking themselves in, or, or you know, backing themselves into a corner right now? This is the uh, this is the question from the audience. I I think uh, they are backing themselves into a corner, um, but as Professor Kraska has noted, we have to be very careful about um, resting on our laurels of the past. 
um, and as Alex has noted about uh, the increasing naval power of China. They've just recently uh, tested hypersonic weapons, um, launched them from aircraft. And uh, you know the, the way that technology is changing is so fast, and actually I address this in the book in terms of the concept of um, the acceleration of the uh, concentration of power, because as power aggregates, the gravitational pull of that power, if you will, accelerates uh, the actual concentration of power. So what was a, a, a slow process thousands of years ago, I would argue is, a, is becoming very, very quick now that um, the, the power of China is so concentrated relative to the US. Um, for example, Xi Jinping controls an economy that's actually larger than the US economy if you consider purchasing power parity. Um, and he has almost total control of that economy relative to the US president who is trying to organize uh, multiple parties and uh, uh, corporations that have their own interests and bottom lines to, to, uh, to attend to. So um, they are in some senses, I would say ideologically, they are backing themselves into a corner because no one really believes um, in communism anymore. But um, militarily and economically, they're taking off like, uh, like crazy. So uh, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, James or, uh, or Alex, uh, do you have any comments on uh, Anders' uh, thoughts there? I, I would suggest that if the United States really were thinking strategically, uh, that it would be aiding both Russia and India and nudging them in this direction, making it easier for them to be able to uh, help to balance China uh, in addition to the European Union. And certainly with Russia, we haven't been doing that. We're still not over this Russia obsession uh, of, um, of Putin. And obviously, Moscow doesn't make it easy invading their neighbors. And so I'm not defending Russia. But from a strategic standpoint, just like the United States could work with the USSR during, the, during World War II, there are commonalities of interest that are not uh, exploited and we fumbled every time we've attempted uh, over the past 20 years to reach some sort of uh, accommodation. India is even a larger tragedy because when you think about it, India and China both have about the same population. 30 years ago, their economies were the exact same size. Today, China's economy is seven times larger than India's. The reason why is not because the Chinese are seven times more industrious. In fact, they may not be as industrious as uh, East Indians. It's because China benefited from the world's greatest social justice experiment uh, ever conducted in which the Western states in Japan, Australia, uh, United States and Europe gave favorable terms to China intentionally wanting to build them up. And think about what if we had done that to India? We picked the wrong horse. And the question is, is it too late to, to be able to make some choices now? James, thank you. Uh, you know, we picked the wrong horse is, is right. Uh, how we could make the decision, uh, communi communism, totalitarianism versus a democracy in India. I'm not sure how that took place, but uh, here we are today. I just I wanted to actually pick up and go back on on Alex's point with respect to the uh, build up the military and and military strength by the U.S. Uh, as we know, China's been engaged in what we now all know is as a hybrid hybrid warfare. And really, is it not about the technology uh, and their incredible ability in which to ostensibly you know, render our forces inept or, you know, before we even get them, you know, into the theater. Let's talk about Taiwan specifically. You know, where does that sit on the technological side and, and how do we compete? Uh, because we are clearly losing the war because they obviously, within their own uh, capabilities in terms of technology, but naturally the stealing of much of our uh, of our own technology here in the West uh, through various academic institutions uh, and directly through espionage. 
Uh, so just some, uh, uh, I'd be interested in your comments on that. Uh, thanks. It, you mentioned uh, espionage, uh, Dean, and I think that, that that's a critical issue that also was just uh, put up by a questioner uh, in the audience. The questioner asked, says, I don't get it. The rest of the world doesn't want China to be the de facto world leader. What's keeping the rest of the world from pushing back together? Um, and this is one of the reasons why I'm actually very proud to be uh, part of the Optimum Publishing International um, authorship, um, because the work that has been done uh, by Dean's publishing house, in particular, for example, uh, Sam Cooper's book, Willful Blindness, um, and Clive Hamilton and Marie's book, um, really illustrates how uh, China is, and the Chinese Communist Party in particular, is able to use uh, bribery, corruption, um, and our own business leaders who are highly influential um, in Washington, Brussels, London, um, Ottawa. Uh, they use our own business leaders against democracy, um, and they, in a sense, paralyze our country's responses, defensive responses, uh, to the Chinese Communist Party um, through this, this kinds of, these kinds of corruption. So I think that's a very, very good question, and um, one that is, you know, if, if you want to understand it, read uh, Clive Hamilton's work, published by Optimum, read uh, Sam Cooper's work published by Optimum. And uh, I think that should help help uh, clear things up. <laughs> Thank you, Anders, for that. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, James or Alex, did you want to speak on that in terms of, of our loss uh, and how China has ostensibly stolen much of our technology, a lot of our artificial intelligence, and now we're using that and weaponizing that against, against us in the West? Yeah. Look, it's it's a it's one of as someone mentioned earlier, the way in which we chose to not just passively watch China's theft of our not just intellectual property, but active destruction of our industrial base through its trade policies and through its uh, through its economic warfare campaign. Um, we, we didn't just watch it; we actually enabled it. We we consciously made a decision to perpetuate policies like entry into the WTO, um, most favored nation, all of this stuff. We abetted it for 20 years. It was bipartisan. It was supported by the leaders of U.S. industry. It was supported by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It was supported by all the people who should have been fighting against this, and they, they bought into it. And what we're dealing with now is a slow realization um, it's not too late. I don't believe for a second it's too late. But people are now confronting a, a position where, just like India has watched itself decline relative to China over that period, we, whether it's technological, whether it's military, whether it's economic, whether it's preparing ourselves uh, internally, intelligence capabilities, uh, structural and organizational capabilities to combat uh, disinformation and, and Chinese uh, malign influence to prepare ourselves for great power competition. We're in this huge disadvantage. We're, we're now running uphill um, with you know, weights around our ankles when we shouldn't have had to do that. And, and so we, we, we're in this rebuilding phase that really should be over in the next couple of years. We should be positioned as a government to, to accurately and, and uh, prepare ourselves for the competition. I think the Trump administration did a lot to lay the groundwork for that organizationally. Now, as, as uh, Professor Kraska said, the key is to have continuity where we're, we're going to be able to, across administrations and parties, set an agenda for how to compete and implement it over years and decades. Uh, and that's, that's where we need to be headed across domain technology, military, diplomatic, all of them. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Great comments um, from, from both. My, my view is that we're even though we say we're not, we're still in the mindset of the end of history. And we think that this is just a problem to be managed, uh, much like Cuba has been a problem to be managed. Uh, but our hubris uh, doesn't allow us to take it seriously. Look, we cannot even agree that we should not allow the, the 
PLA military to run TikTok and collect data on America's school children. We can't even get a bipartisan consensus to stop TikTok uh, in the United States, let alone do something serious to impose costs on China for all of its unlawful conduct, all of its cyber theft, all of its uh, espionage, um, economic warfare. The United States has the capability to do things, particularly in cyberspace, and because we valued stability or this optics of stability, we've been unwilling to, to do that. Now we are losing out on capabilities. Uh, hypersonic weapons, China is ahead. Quantum key communications, uh, China is ahead. Artificial intelligence remains to be seen. They may be ahead or, or, or equal to the United States. So we are, we are losing our, our, uh, our superiority and capabilities and we've never really had the willpower to push back. This is what's so concerning. Thank you, uh, James. You know, that actually, you know, your comment there with respect to it's awareness now, where we're seeing this global awareness, we're seeing it in leaders. The question is whether or not they're going to take action uh, and actually bring policy um, and uh, legislation to combat it. Um, I'd be interested to know the panel's thoughts on that great power competition. And has this now put America and the Western world on notice and we are now stepping up our game. Are we stepping up our game to adequately compete with China's rise? Unfortunately, I would say we're not stepping up our game sufficiently. Um, I think to really respond to China, we would need an exponential increase in our, uh, in our willingness um, to you know, engage in risk and engage in, in uh, straight up competition. Um, and, uh, you know, accept that they are more than really a competitor. China is, a, is an adversary, um, and to call them a competitor as if this is some sort of game uh, with democracy on the table. You know, if we lose this, there goes democracy, hundreds of years of development, um, you know, thousands of years of development. And uh, it's, it's not a game. It's not a competition. It's a deadly serious uh, thing, especially when we see what the CCP does and what their concept of governance is in China. Uh, they're engaging in at least one genocide, I would argue three, um, in China within, you know, by the UN uh, Convention on Genocide. The definition there is very clear, and they are engaged in the eradication of multiple minority populations. Uh, they want to turn them into, into Han Chinese um, and uh, if, if they win this quote unquote competition with the US and the Western world and democracy, um, you know, we can expect the same in our own countries. So we have to take this much, much more seriously. And we just so far, we're not doing it. James or Alex? Sure. Uh, look, I, I think the the point is well taken about the seriousness with which we need to approach the comp the well I was going to say competition I won't say that anymore but uh, the, the way in which we're going to approach our uh, rivalry with China and I, I think that the challenge is you know a lot of that, I'll just take one example economically there are things that we need to do economically to prepare ourselves to resist their economic warfare. There are things we need to do economically and industrially to prepare for what could be, in worst case scenarios, protracted kinetic uh, conflict. We don't have the political will today in Washington to do those things because those things are called industrial policy, and industrial policy is bad. Industrial policy means that you know, it gets sloganeered and it gets turned into, well, you want to make America Europe, you're, you're a socialist. You know, I, I think we're still not there yet with the level of seriousness that's needed in our domestic politics to make some of the hard choices. I'll give you an example. The CHIPS Act. People could argue about there are things in the CHIPS Act that I don't particularly like. There are things in the CHIPS Act that are just different from my personal U.S. domestic politics. But the overall goal of having a semiconductor industry 
that can be subsidized to compete with China, that is an absolutely existential capability that if we do not have, we will we will become uh, a tributary nation. There is no, uh, in my view, there is no way around that. And so we have to put aside uh, petty things, put aside childish things, and start making some really tough uh, decisions in Washington. And I, I agree with Anders. We may have started laying some of the foundation that we have to lay, but we still aren't there yet with the level of seriousness. That, uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, so one of the big things that seems to be on the table right now in terms of China pushing back in a number of different areas, we just uh, heard various declarations coming out of COP26 um, recently, uh, we had China's once again, you know, espounding that they will, you know, make their commitments to, uh, to, uh, uh, combating climate change. Yet we know that emissions have gone down in the West for the last 25 years and China's have risen. They now can use this as a weapon in any negotiations with, uh, with Western states. Um, are our leaders naive as well? to believe that we can actually combat climate change without having a fully engaged and pushing back on China? And does that perhaps take new legislation in terms of putting tariffs on manufactured goods from China so that there is an environmental tax put on them? Because I, I, I can't see how we win this issue on climate change uh, with China and their ability to continue to put up new coal fire plants almost weekly, I think still. Yes, absolutely true. Um, we can't beat climate change without, uh, you know, China and India, um, especially China, um, you know, being better on this subject. And what's interesting is that, of course, when you have a huge existential problem like uh, global warming um, and you have uh, a world of sovereign states, um, you know, the attempts, for example, by Boris Johnson at COP26 to herd cats and get everyone to do things um, and, and make sacrifices is very, very difficult. Um, and this is exactly one of, the, one of the causes of the concentration of power because there's this problem that's international and we need international coordination. You know, you immediately create a cause uh, for international uh, law, actually. And this is, this is of course, where uh, Professor Kraska is an expert. Uh, one of the many places where Professor Kraska is an expert, but um, you know, one of the one of the places where we really have a problem, for example, is China is subsidizing uh, fuel of its fishing fleet uh, in the South China Sea, um, and uh, um, you know, I think that uh, you know, I think Professor Kraska has a lot of knowledge about the South China Sea, and it would be great to hear uh, his comment on that as well. James? Um, sure, thank you, Anders. I mean, getting back to sort of the, the theme of the book, which is how do we, how do we ensure that, that the West and the United States is not overtaken by this hostile and illiberal concentration of power? And to what extent, you know, to, to refer to Eisenhower's military industrial complex, to what extent do we have to harness the energies of the United States to concentrate power in order to do so, either in, within the country or in the global system? If you had to choose, of course, you would choose the liberal hegemon over the illiberal hegemon. But the, I mean, the problem is, uh, is there. Um, yeah, I'll defer to someone else. Thank you, James. Well, actually, let me just, we're going to try to get a couple last questions in here because we're getting very close to uh, the end of the hour, top of the hour. Um, so uh, I think, uh, Alex, perhaps, you know, given your work in, uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, specifically, uh, I'm going to ask uh, you this question. You know, why is it that China thinks they can just take over the South China Seas is a question from the audience. Well, they, they, they think that because they've been allowed to. Um, they, they think that because they were met with very little response 
when they started building uh, artificial features in the, the two, in 20, early 2010s. And if the response from the United States had been different at the time, um, and you know, of course, Professor Kraska is the, the leading expert on the, the legal piece of this, but if they had had a different political and military and diplomatic response from the United States enforcing international law, um, I don't think that you would have seen this behavior. And, and the unfortunate part is the behavior has metastasized into other parts of the world. And these things are not isolated. And we, we watch as they probe in the South China Sea, they violate international law with impunity, they receive no tangible response, um, and so they try it in the East China Sea, and they try it in the Sinkopis, and then they try it with the Aden, and they try it with Taiwan, and they try it in, uh, they, they continue it in the Pacific Islands, they continue it all over the world, and it, it's never met with a sufficient response, um, and that's a failure of policy. That's not a, that's, that's really just a consistent failure of policy across U.S. administrations. Well, I guess on top, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I was just going to add, I, I think Alexander is exactly right in this. Um, the United States was focused solely on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan from, uh, from 2001 until uh, the South China Sea arbitration and, and began to get going with uh, seizure of Scarborough Shoal in 20, 2012 and then the case in 2013. And during that time, the United States was absent. This was in the era when we talked about being virtually present, which meant that we were actually absent and China filled that vacuum and they've uh, already embellished their position a decade ago. And so th this is just uh, coming home to roost. The, the fact that the United States could not walk and chew gum we couldn't do Iraq and Afghanistan and China at the same time. Yes, well, that uh, that could be uh, another evening unto itself. Uh, one last question here uh, from Robert Falcon Willett. Um, how strong is the Chinese military? My understanding is that while the Chinese military has been modernizing, they have not fought wars in a very long time. What would be the likely outcome of a conventional conflict. I don't know whether that's a big, big topic. Maybe we just limit that to the South China Seas or, but uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, your answer to that question. I think it's a very strong uh, threat. I think it's a very strong military threat. And I think we consistently underestimate China uh, militarily, politically, diplomatically. Um, and we really have to up our game. Um, as far as, um, uh, you know, I, I would I would be also interested to hear what Alex and James have to say. Of course, they they've got deep knowledge of this issue. James, um, sure. I would just uh, I want to leave time for Alex. Uh, I guess a couple of thoughts come to mind. Uh, in my view, the the best analysis of this that's pithy is in yesterday's Wall Street Journal by Jerry Hendricks. Uh, talking about how the United States is just outranged in the Pacific. It's the exact same problem that we had in Europe during the Cold War when the Soviet Union introduced SSN-25s and the United States and Europe, NATO in response, uh, installed ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing twos. So we are outranged by Chinese uh, ballistic missile artillery in East Asia, it's, uh, is, is my view, and it's in the Jerry Hendricks piece in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the second point is that, remember, the Chinese Alex, why don't you take it? Sure. I, I would just say I, I think everything Professor Kraska said is, is accurate and, and highly recommend the Jerry Hendricks piece as well. To me, it's, it's not just a question of what is the outcome of an actual peer-to-peer uh, -peer fight, which I, I still think um, depending on the situation, depending on uh, a variety of different scenarios, I still think the United States is in a very good position uh, for some years to come, but the advantage is eroding every every day. The advantage erodes, and we're not doing enough to, to reverse the erosion. To me, the biggest challenge is the deterrent impact of China continuing to grow its capability and our capability going down 
um, ultimately there will be a U.S. president who has to make a decision about how to confront Chinese aggression, and he's going to have to make that, or she's going to have to make that decision based on American capabilities versus Chinese capabilities. And at some point, um, you know, having watched how these decisions get made to some extent, the president's going to say, I'm just not comfortable with the parity that they've achieved. I'm, my decision in terms of how to protect U.S. interests is now going to be made based on a calculation of what is Chinese, Chinese strength. And, and unfortunately, we're headed, in my view, towards a place where it's conceivable an American president would say, I don't know that we're strong enough to decisively defeat China, even in a regional confrontation. Uh, I'm gonna hold I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off. And that that's a huge problem. So can I say would you guys agree time is on China's side here? I I think I would qualify that by saying there are a lot of internal dynamics in China that that they should be worried about, and I think Xi Jinping's behavior indicates he is worried about. That being said, uh, we have not done enough domestically to uh, to put time on our side either. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. That the, the direction of the arrow is going in the wrong way. The Chinese certainly believe that time is on their side. Indeed. Um, Anders, just before we close here, I was wondering if you had any final comments uh, for uh, for tonight um, and uh, you want to offer to uh, the viewers uh, this evening before well, we close off. Well, thanks all, all of you guys and everyone who's watching today. Um, I wrote the book because I think it's a critical, a very important message um, to about current politics, really, but that looks at it from a historical perspective. Um, we're in a moment of extreme danger, essentially, uh, because the historical trend and the causes are towards more liberality, more, uh, more concentration of power. And the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing, are very, very well positioned uh, to uh, essentially <laughs> get to an end of history that's quite a liberal. Um, so we need to take this, this absolutely critically and uh, I guess that's the that's the bottom line of the book. Thank you guys for showing up and being interested. Uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, in closing tonight, first of all, I, I would like to thank our distinguished panel, uh, Alexander Gray and James Kraska, um, and uh, Anders, of course. Uh, it was great talk. I think we we just got got going. Uh, we could have gone uh, many more hours, and perhaps we'll get an opportunity in the new year to uh, attack. Uh, these subjects uh, again on, on another panel. Um, I just want to let you know that the, the book, The Concentration of Power, is available uh, at the Optimum website, and uh, we have a special offer. We will, anybody who buys the digital version and reads page 36 and is actually not awestruck by it, can have their money back. And uh, uh, so I think that uh, this is the offer that Anders asked me to to uh, to give to our audience tonight. So go onto the Optimum site. You can buy a digital version. We'll give you your money back if you're not absolutely awestruck and uh, buy that buy that particular uh, uh, page. Uh, in closing, thank you once again, everybody. Thanks to our team behind the, the scenes in terms of making this happen. Uh, this will be available on the Optimum YouTube channel, uh, where we expect it to get a lot of play over the next few months. This has been a fantastic uh, journey and a fantastic uh, talk. Anders, I wanna thank you for having the courage to write this book, uh, for bringing forward what I think uh, leaders around the world and around the globe need to hear. We need more authors like you and uh, like Kraska and Alexander in your space to come out and speak to the liberal um, factors that are, are reshaping our world and actually threatening our democracies and freedoms. So thank you, all of you, for doing what you do. With that, I would like to bid everybody good night. Thank you. <laughs>